This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and it is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group. That's a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. Be sure to join our Patreon. That gives you access to our moderated community chats, exclusive TP and our merch. You know, everybody likes the coffee mug and the tote bag and all that free stuff. Um, but uh, really, it, there, there's other benefits, commercial free uh, episodes. But really, it's it's a great help to our program. It's subscribers who help us help us keep these conversations going. So in, in all sincerity, thank you to our subscribers. Uh, just go to patreon.com slash politics and religion. Patreon.com slash politics and religion. And also make sure to write that review of this program. We'll put the link to the Patreon and an easy way to access reviews in all our show notes. Um, and it helps. It, it really does help. So we continue having great conversations like the one we're having today with Reed Galen. Reed Galen, an original co-founder of the Lincoln Project, is now heading up the Union, a coalition of pro-democracy volunteers and grassroots supporters. And you can also find Reed doing something he's really good at at the home front, writing and, and podcasting, all of which we'll be discussing today. Uh, just a little bit of background. Not everybody's been listening all four years of this show. So uh, <laughs> just to catch you up on a little bit of uh, what, what Reed's been doing. Um, he has served as deputy campaign manager for John McCain's presidential campaign and deputy campaign manager for Arnold Schwarzenegger's successful reelection campaign in 2006. And prior to that, Reed worked on both the 2000 and 2004 campaigns of President George W. Bush and served in the White House during the Bush administration in both the U.S. Department of Treasury and the Department of Homeland Security, all of which means he's not quite as old as me, but he's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> a little more every day, man. Yeah, yeah. It's so great to have you back on the program. How are you holding up, man? You know, it's it's just, you know, I've lived my life, so much of my life in two-year cycles, and I'm hoping that this two-year cycle is the one that is the capstone um, to this particular part of the adventure and that we can move on to... Well, the fight will continue, but a different part of the fight anyway. Yeah, yeah. I've been waiting for your your podcast and your 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 substack to transition to what is it you're doing in Utah? Like an alpaca farm or something like that? <laughs> I would listen, I, my dream is a goat farm. Yes. Okay. I would love to have a goat farm. Once once democracy is secured for the populace and the world, yes, I would like to uh like to sit in the sunshine with my flock and and watch the sunset. Um, but we've got a little bit of time before that happens. A little bit of time, a little bit of work to do. Uh, speaking of work to do, I, I figured we'd start where we often end, and that and that's with some updates. Um, you, as I alluded to in the in the um, in the opening, you, you're working on some really cool stuff with the union, getting so much traction uh, that it's now an independent entity started under the umbrella of the Lincoln Project. And then you know you're a terrific writer, uh, terrific podcaster. I I, I listened to uh, when I first started podcasting, I was listening to a lot of your interviews and just taking notes, like how you do journalism in this new, uh, relatively new medium. Um, right. So if you could just update us on how that's all going with the home sure. front and the union. Sure. And again, thanks again for having me back. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we started the, the Lincoln Project almost five years ago, which is it's hard to believe. Um and, you know, earlier this summer, I said, you know, look, you guys have have really cornered the market on political advertising. You don't really need my help in that anymore. Um, and so, you know, my two things that I'm I'm frankly, I'm not an ad guy, never have been. Um, what I'm good at is the strategy and the research and the, you know, and the bringing of different groups and people together. Uh, that's really the thing that I've enjoyed most about uh, our time in this fight in the pro-democracy coalition. And so, you know, the idea that I could talk to someone like my friend Olivia Troy, um, you know, who was uh, deputy national security advisor uh, to Mike Pence when he was in the White House uh, in the morning. And I could talk to an activist in eastern North Carolina or in Center City, Philadelphia or in Mesa County, Arizona in the afternoon, um, you know, and find some way that we can all work together. You know, that's the kind of stuff that that really keeps my engine fired up and, and me moving forward. And so, yeah, we started the union back in March of 2022, just on the strength of the idea that, you know, Lincoln had so many people, so many followers, such a big megaphone. 
And, you know, we had these millions of people that were following us on the social media and everything else and say, OK, why don't we take that and apply it down into the states where these fights, these political fights are going to happen? And, you know, since then, we've recruited something like 50 or 60,000 volunteers, 12,000 of those are are active pretty much on a daily basis. We've got incredible state teams in every electoral college state, and we're working up and down the ballot. We have about 100 partner organizations. And really, it's one of those things where we make sure that if if there's a campaign, right, that we see that we think needs support from the outside at the grassroots level, we can support that. And if there are organizations that need, frankly, just bodies thrown at a, a text bank or a phone bank or a canvas, uh, that we can do those things, too. And so, you know, it's been an incredible thing to see how it's grown really, you know, without any help from me. And so now I'm just, you know. Most people wouldn't say this, but now I'm a pretty face. I go out, I preach the gospel. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to hit the road here in about ten days out in, in uh, excuse me, in uh, Pennsylvania in our first uh, weekend of action in Lehigh County and Bucks County and Eastern PA, and then out in Allegheny and Western PA, and then we'll be all over the electoral college states here, you know, in the next sixty days. And so it's been an incredible thing to see. Um, and then, yeah, on the on the more creative front, yeah, you know, I started my Substack, the Home Front, about a year ago. Uh, and you can find me over there. And then just uh, this week, as we're speaking, I relaunched uh, my own podcast. I, I, I hosted the Lincoln Project podcast for about three and a half years. I launched my own show here recently, uh, also called The Home Front. Might as well make it easy on people. Um, and, you know, I'll do the same thing I did uh, when I was on the air for those three years, right, which is talking to folks like you. Uh, who are at the forefront of the democracy movement, trying to figure out exactly how it is we move through this period, how we turn this page. Um, you look, the next eight weeks are going to be focused almost exclusively on the campaign itself, talking to Republicans, talking to Democrats, analyzing where the campaign is. Um, the things that I, I love to do and, and I think that people like to listen to, as you noted from my my you know ever lengthening uh, resume, <laughs> uh, I've been at this a long, long time, and it goes back even before the things you mentioned. I, I, I like to say most kids went to summer camp and I went to Capitol Hill. So um, maybe that turned that's the reason I turned out the way I did. But it's been a heck of a fight, and I'm excited. Decided to both start a new chapter and hopefully close the book on one pretty difficult chapter in American political history. Yeah. Yeah. You, one thing I was really curious about with regard to we with regard to the the union and, and the organization as as much as it's grown and in all 50 states and tens of thousands of volunteers. I've also heard that about the Harris Walls campaign that since she uh, became the nominee at the top of the ticket, that tens of thousands of volunteers and uh, regular folks like me, we hear phrases like boots on the ground. So right. a lot of us see parts of the convention or the speeches or the TV commercials, but uh, I'm learning that boots on the ground can really make the difference, especially in the state that you're going to be in in a, in a couple of weeks. W what what does that mean when you when you say a hundred thousand volunteers? What are those folks doing? What are what what in um, practical terms does boots on the ground mean? So uh, let me let me relate my own experience uh, of the 2022 cycle. Uh, I was in East Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a pretty rough part of town. And I remember uh, a volunteer, uh, you know, leader and I were walking around and knocked on a, a gentleman's door. And we said, hey, you know, we're here from the union, you know, pro-democracy organization. He's like, I, I've got my ballot, but I'm not going to vote. You know, I don't care about this. I don't care about that. They're all crooks. Uh, you know, it doesn't change my life. And uh, my counterpart sort of went into the traditional, um, you know, here's here's what Senator so-and-so will do for you. Uh, you know, I don't care. I don't care. I said, look, I'm not a, I'm not a Republican anymore. I'm not a Democrat either. I get it. I understand exactly why you feel the way you do. Right. And and we so we had a, this conversation at his door, five, seven, nine minutes. And at the end of it, he said, all right, look, I'm not promising I'm going to vote, but I'll take a look at my ballot. And I said, that's all I can ask. And you have to have about a million of those conversations. Right. And not everybody you talk to. First of all, you're going to knock on a lot of doors. Nobody's home. Uh, the ring doorbell <laughs> right, has alerted to a lot of people to canvassers coming. Um, and so if they don't want to talk to you, they're just not going to answer the door because they see you. Um, but, you know, the doors are still probably the best way. One on one interaction is probably still the best way for humans to 
connect and to have a conversation that's just not possible. Look, you and I are speaking on Zoom right now, and it's become ubiquitous since COVID, right? And we often take it for granted. We take for granted the fact that people coming together for a common cause uh, really does create almost like a friction, right? Think about it almost like Velcro, right? As, as more and more people are together, they start to stick together. They create a bond with one another and within this sort of community, this organization. And I think we've lost a lot of that. So, you know, whether or not it's with the union or what we're hearing out of the Harris Waltz campaign, right? You know, those people coming together, working side by side, right? And as you know, campaign officers are not fancy, right? Canvassing yeah. is not glamorous. Phone banks are not glamorous. Um, they are hard work. Uh, they are sometimes unfulfilling because you get people who aren't very nice to you, um, but you get up and you do it again. And so from my perspective, here we are some 60 days away. Uh, you know, look, some people be getting their ballots in the next two weeks. Um, right. And every one of those people that we can identify uh, as someone who is likely to vote and we can ensure that they cast that ballot as soon as they get it is one more vote in the right direction. One more vote we don't have to hope for on election day. And ironically enough, it was when I was part of the Republican party that we, we really perfected that early vote strategy to know exactly who was there, who you had and going into election day, what your vote goal needed to be. And Don Donald Trump, frankly, single-handedly wrecked that for the GOP. Mm. And they've been, they've been, you know, suffering for it really since 2016, 2020. So you bring up a, a lot of good points that, that I want to uh, pull on these threads. Uh, one is there are folks who do want to get more involved in a more formal way. And I did sure. notice on jointheunion.us, uh, is that the mm -hmm. right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, so jointheunion.us, yeah. One of the cool things, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think that there's all kinds of opportunities to get involved, not just in the Pennsylvanias, North Carolinas, Wisconsin, Michigan, Nevada, but even in a state like uh, like California, where I happen to live, there's different ways, whether it's phone banking, what have you. So right. th those are ways, and I, I would imagine uh, that there's good training for folks that are doing more cold calls and cold conversations like that. What about more um, everyday folks uh, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think Facebook must be on to me. They're, they're aggregating <laughs> these posts from folks I graduated high school with that post something, how much they loved going to the Trump rally and, you know, or some meme about, uh, you know, uh, T Tim walls, uh, pe people often tell them to send their love to, to send their love to, uh, to Gwen. And, and, and I've heard that he never sends his love. How, how awful, you know, how, how much of a lot, you, you know what it is like yeah. all these terrible things that they're trying to make up. Um, but my question is one for whether it's folks who do want to get involved more formally or in the everyday conversations on Facebook with people that we know in our Bible studies at the coffee shop around the soccer field where our kids are playing soccer. Um, what are there one, two, three pieces of advice that you'd give for people just dispositionally even in order to enter into those conversations to give you a better batting average of it not going off the rails and maybe having a good shot at having a productive conversation? Um, yeah. And look, I think it's really important. First, let me just say that Facebook is sending you that stuff because that's what the algorithm favors, right? Mm. Let's be very clear. Like social media algorithms are patently unhealthy and they send us stuff that is more likely to make us angry yeah. than things that we want to, we would otherwise think we want to see. So that's one. Secondly is I think patience is the first part. If someone is very, very entrenched in a belief system, whatever it is, Coming up and immediately telling them that you're wrong or you're <laughs> stupid, not going to get you what you want. Um, I would say this is that, you know, you have to ask a lot of questions. You have to remain calm, right? Because remember, too, that part of the defense mechanism is to say, well, you know, if if you as the person who's asking someone about their belief system begin to get upset, they go, well, look, how can I take you seriously? You know, you're just look at you're 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 crazy. You're unhinged. Right. And so that's that's part of it. But. The more that you criticize, right, off the bat, um, the likely they are to be just doubly entrenched in the belief system. And again, it's wholly unsatisfying and it takes a long time. I mean, Corey, what I like to say is, unfortunately, movements like MAGA buy in bulk, but they sell one at a time, right? They, That's it, interesting. It takes, it takes a long time to get somebody back out of oh, that belief system. Okay. Um, because here's the other part. It's self-reinforcing, which is 
if you're there, there's a reason there's, and there's a million psychological studies and people who are far more expert at this than I am, but it's because you've been looking for something, right? You have felt, uh, excluded unseen. Yeah. unseen. I think that did that to a COVID did that to a lot of people who that were suddenly stuck in their homes, um, and didn't have any place else to go. I think there were a lot of people who, uh, didn't feel welcome in the American political system because they felt like, you know, both parties were rigged or the whole thing and Trump's behavior and actions and words and deeds like, Oh, I like that. I I'm, I'm willing to be a part of that because, you know, he's, he's talking my language. Now it's a language that's fr fundamentally unhealthy to democracy and public discourse, but that's what they were looking for. And so he invited them out of the woods and into the, into the mainstream. Um, they were looking for a party to go to and he gave them an invitation. And so, yeah, there's there's no good answer this to this other than it's going to take time. And from my perspective, I know this sounds like a cop out. I hope it's not, is that the fastest way to get people out of this belief system is to defeat someone like him and defeat him so soundly. And we've seen this in other pieces. And, you know, Hannah Arendt in her writing is that when a when an authoritarian leader like him is defeated, some of the movement will have sort of a Rip Van Winkle moment. Like, what was I thinking? What was mm. I doing here? Yeah, I remember growing up in the 80s, our parents were the generation that voted in Nixon in a landslide, and yet you couldn't find a single Nixon voter anywhere <laughs> you look. Right. You know, so I'm hoping that whether it's five years, 10 years, or 15 years, um, may maybe this will just be an embarrassment. Maybe folks will have uh, amnesia about it. Um, but yeah, I, I it, it, it's confounding. Um, I do think you're right, though, that there is what um, Rene Darista calls bespoke realities uh, that oh, sure. reinforces uh, folks' ability to address um, their grievances that in 2020, one of the themes of the campaign was he's fighting for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it definitely resonated with a lot of folks. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money, <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me, he knows my family, and I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on, and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals, and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which, by the way, could change from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Mesa and Mesa Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mazawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mazawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. I do want to touch on uh, some things that you've written here recently. Um, really appreciate, actually recalled recently uh one of the first uh pieces or actually uh, a piece that i read this morning uh, from a, a few days ago you reposted uh, an article that you first published in october of 2016 yeah. um called gop's great schism uh and i'll read just a, a little bit of it from uh from the middle of of the piece uh, you say, we know that the United States deserves better than what we've seen in 2016. We know we bear responsibility for shaping the environment that created all this. That fact keeps many of us awake at night. We know that we must be a part of fixing our deteriorating system, deteriorating system and that many entrenched and entitled institutions will resist this reform. As I was reading that, like so much of this piece still resonates directly yeah. today. It's a bullseye for today. But I also couldn't help but wonder what kind of price did you have to pay back then and over these last eight years, almost a decade, for taking such a public stance against that orthodoxy that you'd been a part of for so long? Um, 
you know, I think this is the, that's a, it's a great question because the truth is, um, I, you know, look, I have lost friends. Um, I have been at the highest of highs in American politics and been beaten down in that, you know, within months of each other. Um, and, you know, there's the threats and, you know, things like that that come along with it. Uh, but the truth is I wouldn't change anything that's happened since then. Um, as, as I told somebody the other day during another interview, you know, when I saw Trump come down the escalator, first I thought he was a joke. And then as he started to rise through the polls, there was never a moment for me where I'm like, oh, yeah, I could get along with this. I could I, I could see how this works because he wasn't a Republican. Right. He was always a carnival barker. This was a guy who was never serious, but he in the movement that has propelled him or that he, you know, he carried into to prominence like he was what they were looking for. And I said to myself, as as he was approaching taking the nomination in 2016, like if this is what the Republican Party wants now, like count me out. That's not what I that's not what I grew up with. I, I, uh, I worked for George W. Bush for a long time, you know, going back to when I was in college in Texas. And, you know, his main issues were education, jobs and immigration. Right. Like those things are not only so far in the past, but so far away mm. from where the Republican Party is today. Uh, you know, I, I, the price I paid, whatever it is, has been worth it Yeah, um, because I can sleep at night. I can say. You know, in my own little way, um, you know, come November 6, 2024, uh, if if Vice President Harris and Governor Waltz win, like, I, you know, when the time came, I did my part. When yeah. the time came, I didn't put my head down. Uh, I put my head up. I didn't sit down. I didn't sit back. I stood up. And so, you know, to me, that's the thing. And I, I won't ask it of everyone. And it's not for everyone. Um, but for those of us who've had the opportunity, I have seen – more incredible things for more incredible people. Uh, I've gotten to know people across the aisle and across the country, uh, and I wouldn't give it up for anything. Yeah, was that your first DNC? You went to the DNC a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah, I was in Chicago. I actually attended Barack Obama's acceptance speech in Denver in 2008, uh, okay. but that was because I happened to be there for a, a campaign anyway, and a friend of mine had an extra ticket. So as an old advance man, it was an incredible like sight, right? Yeah. Like to behold, because it was the Denver Broncos stadium and it was huge, but I was, I was no Barack Obama fan at the time, right? right? I'd worked for John McCain. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was interesting to see, um, you know, I worked at three Republican conventions, 92, 96, and 2000, uh, and I'd attended 2004 on the reelect. Um, and so, you know, it was it was interesting to see how much of them are similar. Uh, but in that in that hall on Wednesday night, I was there when um, Governor Walt spoke. It was an incredible amount of energy, an incredible amount of joy um, and a lot of momentum. And I thought it was great to see. And like I said, I saw a whole bunch of Republicans. You know, I, I, I sat with George Conway, an old friend of mine. And, you know, it was great to see so many people who had locked arms and marched forward together. Yeah, Conway's on fire these days. I love what that dude's doing. Ooh, he is. George, George, there are no bars to hold with George. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you about some of those other folks. It, it's, it has been almost a decade uh, since you nailed, as you put it, the, the list of, you nailed the list of grievances to the RNC's door. Right. Um, so there's been a lot of folks uh, that stayed with, that have stayed, you know, true Trump the whole time. Right. Um, others hopped off the train at different points along the way. And I'm I'm asking you, since you saw this, it's it's like a, a pernicious poison essentially from the start, um, and especially because you have been the target of of a lot of vitriol and and harassments. Um, do do you still keep that exit ramp open for Republicans who, for whatever reason, are just now coming to that conclusion they can't support Trump? One hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, look. I would be lying if I said, especially folks who are, you know, in the political system, right, who have, you know, who work in campaigns, who work in policy, who worked at the White House, right? Do I always have as much patience with them? No, but they're the ones who are supposed to, like, know better. Yeah. Um, if you're an individual, but even then, you know, I try and as, I try and maintain as much grace as I can. I'm not always successful, but I try. Um, but if someone is ready to get off that train, I'm not going to make it harder for them. I'm going to say, come on, you you're, you can come hang out with us. I know you, you don't you're not comfortable being a Democrat. You're not comfortable in your own party. Like, welcome to the club. Right. There are a lot of us and there's a lot more than people think. 
Um, look, it's no surprise that you know both national parties are at historic lows as far as popularity is concerned, uh, because you know I, I like to say, Corey, you know, you and I are talking on a device, right? That like none of us really thought about four years ago, right? I mean, we right. had laptops and all that, but you know, I can order any of the six things I've got plugged in here off of Amazon and get them in a day. Yeah. Right. I can watch any movie ever made just by talking into my, my, you know, the, the, the remote control from my TV. Um, and the idea that we still have two parties that this, the newer one of which started in 1854 does seem antiquated. Um, but for now, right. Uh, again, I am part, I am a, I'm a, pro-democracy partisan. Um, and the Democratic Party, unfortunately, from my mind, is the only pro-democracy party we got left. So I will fight alongside them. Sort of think about, to be my history nerd for a second, think about it like sort of being the left wing of the French army at World War I, right? We're not the French. We're not of France. But we were fighting with France because it's better than the alternative. So do you think there is a future to the Republican Party? Mm. Not as it stands today. Yeah. Um, I think that the problem with the party is that Trump has Trump and MAGA, right? And I think they are they are separate but com but intertwined. I would say I think that's probably mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Even if Trump loses, and even if he loses badly in November, you know the people who got lucky by Trump coming down the escalator, they put decades of work and billions of dollars into this infrastructure. It's not as if they're going to say, oh, well, Donald Trump lost, so we're going to fold up our tents and go home. Um, if you look at a lot of states out there, especially, you know, it's not even the old Confederacy anymore. It's almost the new Confederacy. Um, you know, the, the poison is seeped through. I could make an argument that, you know, in 2026, you know, the, the prime thing that many Republican primary candidates are going to be looking for is a Trump endorsement or some some sort of sign of the cross from Trump world saying, yes, he's our guy or she's our gal. Um, and who knows? I mean, the guy's nuts. You know, if he's still alive in 2028, you know, maybe he runs again, but he's not going away. It's it's counterintuitive. He can't he needs he needs attention like he needs oxygen. Right. Um, and he's also learned over the years that attention uh, leads to money. And that's also what he's going to need because he's going to be facing down, you know, lawsuits. He owes different people hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's not as if he can go back to Mar-a-Lago and play 18 every day and just hope to God that this, the world leaves him alone. That's just not going to happen. And he would never let that happen. Yeah, he's going to start meditating and finding his zen. And yeah, just there's no goat the farm. There's, there's no goat farm in Donald Trump's future. Let's <laughs> just put it that way. That's right. You know, I was curious too, though, um, uh, this is kind of getting a little bit more to the present campaign. The most recent piece you, you posted a couple of days ago, you said that because so many people were wrong about Donald Trump's chances in winning in 2016. Many in the political world and the media uh, seem to be overcorrecting, overestimating his chances at winning the next election. W why do you think that uh, this is a mistake? Well, why do you think that folks are making like overcorrecting in that way? Uh, again, because I think they're desperately they're desperate they're desperate not to be wrong again. I mean, look, I thought I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win 340 electoral votes. So what the heck do I know about anything? Um, but I think there's also a part of it that is, you know, I think on the part of the media, especially you know what they would call the mainstream media, whatever you want to say, there's there's a there's a really perverse incentive, which is. They it's like eating fried chicken three meals a day like, you know, it's bad for you, but you just can't help it because it tastes so good. And that's yeah. what Trump does for their bottom lines. You're right. Trump drives ratings. Trump drives clicks. And a lot of these, you know, networks, a lot of these outlets like they want to be in the briefing room if Donald Trump gets reelected. And if they take too hard a line with him, he'll throw him out and nobody's going to tell him he has to take him back in. This isn't like in his first term where you had a, a somewhat normal Supreme Court. This Supreme Court has basically said as president, not only Donald Trump, but any president could do whatever they wanted to. And the idea that it's an official act um, and it'll go to the Supreme, you know, he'll toss a reporter out or an outlet out. They'll go to court and the court's going to be like, what do you want us to do? Sorry. And they don't want to take that chance because there's just too much money on the line. Um, I also think that there's a there's. A strange, almost addiction to it, right? They're addicted to the chaos, right? The mm. Biden administration for all, you know, in the context of 2020, the 2020s is normal. It does the things it's supposed to do. It doesn't really leak. They have a press briefing every day, right? 
you, you don't get constant access to the president or the vice president or senior administration officials. You get access when the administration deems it necessary, which is not always the greatest thing either. But there's, there, they expect that like everybody's going to come out and say something insane like Donald Trump every day. And the media accepts that as, quote unquote, you know, access. It's not access. It's giving him what he wants. And you think that it's good for you when, in fact, it's bad for you and it's bad for the people watching. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. This isn't a prepared question. It's sort of an unformed theory. Uh, mm. l- let me roll it out and see what you think. So the media isn't necessarily uh, rooting for the Democrats or the Republicans so much as they're rooting for the story, which uh, underscores the point that you're making about rooting for – they're kind of addicted to the chaos. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are certain factors that I've been noting for the, the basically the entirety of, of Biden's administration. For example – um, he gets bad. Uh, his administration gets bad uh, grades when it comes to the economy. I don't think the fundamentals necessarily support that. It's not to say that the economy has been perfect. It's not to say that their record has been perfect. But there are a lot of fundamentals, whether it's a low unemployment rate, whether it's a healthy GDP, whether it's um, even acknowledging some of their mistakes and in bringing inflation, for example, back to with, within um, uh, better better levels. But they're they're still getting bad grades on that. Now, one thing that we have seen, it, it, and part of the reason for that, to your point, is that you know, um, a, a normal functioning administration doesn't make for a good story for the press. So it hasn't been right. getting, you know, but if you change the branding at the top, now all of a sudden, instead of a Biden administration, Kamala is, uh, Kamala Harris, VP Kamala Harris is at the top of the ticket. Now you have a, a different brand. And right. all of a sudden, she is not trailing Trump nearly as much. In fact, I just saw one poll where she's um, tracking evenly with him right. on the economy. So you change the branding and good fundamentals allow for a leveling of that. Um, I, I'm, br- I'm bringing a lot of different threads together. But what do you think sure. of that theory? Changing the branding at the top allows for the fundamentals to come to the fore. Um, I think that's right, um, because because the entire dynamic has changed. And, and, and this doesn't occur in a vacuum either. Right. Which is, OK, this is unprecedented in American political history. So that's a story that must be covered. Um, The amount of enthusiasm, the crowds, the money that's rolled in, that's a story. Um, As you said, the the economy has continued to roar along, right? The the S&P and the the stock market continue to grow. Um, You know, the demand for new housing is through the roof. Interest rates are coming down. Um, And, you know, here's the other part too, is that Harris is literally and figuratively about as big a contrast as you can have to Donald Trump. Mm. Um, it was two old guys, and Biden was the older one, he <laughs> right. was the one that looked like he'd lost a few steps. Now Trump is the old guy. And again, now you're comparing. So here's here's the, the press's main complaint. Kamala Harris is new, different, but she won't talk to us, right? And that's our main complaint. Donald Trump is insane, acts insane, acts more insane every day, right? Uh, but he gets, a, he gets a discount on his insanity, right? Um, because he's always been crazy. Um, the, there was, a, there was um, uh, I don't remember who it was. There was a reporter hosting a round table and Trump had started talking. He was doing a thing with Tulsi Gabbard, right? And this is like who they're touting as their big, you know, <laughs> their big endorsers. Right. Um, you know, he starts talking about uh, the the price of sh- you know the price of groceries. Then he talks about the price of bacon. No one eats bacon anymore. Believe me, this country eats bacon. Nothing has stopped this country for me. <laughs> but then it goes on to then he then he something sput- about the wind or something. Yeah. Like then that. he starts sputtering off into the middle of a sentence about windmills, and it's just and and the reporter you know to the to the assembled roundtable said if Kamala Harris did that mid sentence, everybody would be like, what the hell's wrong with her? Yeah. What happened? Did she have some sort of you know, cognitive break right there in the middle of a sentence, but it's him. So he gets away with it on the economy. You know, I'd say this too. It's like how many months in a row do you have to see a headline in the New York times or the wall street journal, the Washington post said jobs up again, unexpectedly, you know, for the eighth straight month, but next month could be worse. Well, right, yeah, right. the sun could explode too, right? right. Like you, you, you did the head the headline reader put that last clause in there simply to get somebody to click on, yeah, right. Yeah. That was why they did it. 
Well, you, you don't understand, you, you know, you, what, what you don't understand is he's doing the weave, you know, and, and many, many brilliant English professors have told him that the way he's able to weave it all together is just absolutely the most brilliant thing they've ever heard. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so it's not just it's not just folks in the media. And I, I hate to bash the media because it, it's part of that is um, is a discernment problem, because I, I find in any given uh, publication, uh, that you can find really good reporters, really sure, good journalists um, on any, uh, uh, you know, any broadcast program. You, you can find good folks doing good analysis. And it frankly, does... we have hundreds of them, if not thousands of them unemployed right now, too, as well. So that's another issue that's that, you know, the media doesn't just have a coverage problem. It's got an economics problem, which is it's probably all wrapped up into one. But I know dozens, you know, of reporters personally who are excellent at their jobs, who've either are out of work or left the the industry altogether because they just can't make a living. Right, right. Um, yeah, so that's part of it. The, the, the on a related topic, there's also a bunch of hacks that work in politics right now. Um, but well, that's <laughs> that's not a new phenomenon, unfortunately. But you, you've worked with some absolute rock stars, so uh, I, I think it's fair to say that the Lincoln Project put together a pretty incredible team. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious what you think in in your in your lane. Um, what do you think separates somebody like Rick Wilson as an ad man or Mike Madrid as a numbers guy? What makes those guys so much more effective at their job than um, the countless others who maybe continue to collect the paycheck but aren't worth crap when it comes to actually doing the job? Um, I think with Rick, it's um, a fundamental understanding that messaging has in politics, but everywhere really, but in politics in particular, messaging should be emotional. You know, Democrats want to talk about issues, which is the head. Yeah. Republicans talk about values, which is the heart. Um, and so writing an ad like any I mean, it's not that hard to sit down and write a 30 second script or a 60 second script. The the work comes in being able to take words and translate those into images that in the course of 30 or 60 seconds or now even less can impart an evocative response in the viewer. Uh, that can grab someone immediately and get them to hold on and can take them through that arc. And that's really difficult. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, and also, you know, one thing I've seen with with too many of my Democratic friends is that they test every ad to within an inch of its life because they're afraid of emotion. They're afraid of upsetting people like as Republicans, like, no, you want the response. You're going for the response. And if you don't get it, you didn't do it right. You didn't hit hard enough. You didn't tug on the part, the heartstrings enough, right? You didn't, you didn't get the tear ducts turned on. And so I think that's really what, what Rick has been able to do as far as Madrid is concerned. Look, this is a guy who's been doing this a long time, right? He's been working in California politics for many, many years. And understands this stuff. And I think, again, it's, you know, whereas Rick is all about the emotion, I think Madrid is also very much like is, is on the other, he's on the other end of the spectrum, which is like very analytical. Okay. Here's what the numbers are. Here's what they mean based on what we've seen before. Here's what we should expect. We can, or will see, you know, in the future. Now, of course, a lot of that is speculation. Um, but again, it's, it's taking the numbers as they are and doing your best to look at them with a jaundiced eye almost, which is I'm not bringing a, a whole heck of a lot of like uh, ideology to this, right? I'm bringing like, what are the facts on the ground and how do we respond to that? Right, right. Makes so much sense what you're saying about the way Rick, a guy like Rick Wilson thinks or Stuart Stevens thinks in terms of um, evoking a feeling uh, with the messaging that they find common cause with all my uh with all my brethren in the entertainment advertising industry, they did a lot sure. of work together uh, with all the trailer companies, um, you know, motivating, motivating people to go out and see a movie on opening weekend is very similar to motivating folks to sure. go out and vote on, on election day. I, I would say it's, it's probably as similar as anything there is for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the two campaigns now uh, at the top of the ticket, specifically what do you make of the quality of their respective teams and what do you make at the effectiveness of their messaging? Um, well, I, 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 you know, when the Trump people, I mean, I think what you have to understand is it's, it's not a campaign. It's him. He is the alpha and the omega of it. Uh, everybody else is in the orbit and, you know, at any given time, they're trying to do a normal political job in, in the most abnormal situation and environment possible. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, from my perspective, I think that they, 
you know, they let Harris, uh, you know, they gave her four five, six weeks of free air. Um, you know, now you could make an, you know, I, I heard yesterday somebody make the argument, oh, they were just, you know, they were just waiting, waiting, waiting. You know, I don't buy it. That's not like the people around Trump, uh, as I've known them in campaigns, they're not the kind of people to wait around. Um, and, you know, if they had it to do over again, you know, would they would they have let Harris off the hook like they did? I can't imagine they would. But then you also see, you know, he does the things like he did at Arlington National Cemetery, or I mentioned the bacon thing, like, you know, he's not really on the road that much. So I think there's a part of it too, is like, you know, every time he goes out and says something like his numbers go down. So maybe we're better off just having him play golf all day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the ads are going to be, you know, very, it's what I call for, for the Trump campaign, we're in what I call the scare the white people zone, right? Like 90% of their voters are white. Um, they're, they're seriously lagging in the, in the suburbs, which they always were because moderate Republicans, independents and moderate Democrats really don't like him. Um, so to be motivated to vote for him again, uh, they have to be just told how terrible Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are not sure they'll buy it this time. Uh, as far as the Harris campaign is concerned, I give them a little bit of a breather because they've been trying to do all this on basically like six weeks notice. Um, uh, and so, you know, look, they had the, they had the infrastructure of the Biden campaign. Um, I'm very impressed with their social response, uh, their press operations, yeah. uh, their willingness to take Trump on, um, and call him out on everything. I've always thought that that was the key in that we saw this back at Lincoln is, um, like general Jap said of the North Vietnamese army, you have to grab them by the belt and keep them close. That's what you have to do to Trump. You have to keep him close. You have to not let him get free. And I think you've seen, as we talked about with his desire for that sunlight, the more he comes into eclipse, the crazier he gets because he's trying to find someone to pay attention to him. He's like a, he's like a toddler, right? That you're not paying attention to. Um, You know, it's like he's jumping up and down. No one's paying attention. He screams while he jumps up and down. No one's paying attention. So he starts smashing plates and eventually (laughs) turn around. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? And he's like, well, you want, I wanted you to pay attention to me. Right. So um, I, I think that the Harris campaign has done well. Um, but look, from my perspective, they really need to fight a two front war, uh, which all campaigns do, which is they should spend the bulk of their money, making sure that they have significantly and well uh, d- defined vice president Harris. I think she's still largely undefined to a country just sort of shaking off the summer summer doldrums. And I think at the same time, they just have to keep the hammer down on Trump, metaphorically, of course, um, and ensuring that everybody knows, that can know um, what it is he and his people represent. Because they tell you, right? Like they didn't print signs that say mass deportation now at their convention by accident. Like they did that on purpose. They want the country to know what they're for. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know um, how you would read a polling. I just saw some polling this uh, yesterday and this morning where uh, on the one it's mixed reviews since the uh, since the DNC, um, Kamala has gained significant ground uh, with women, but she's actually lost ground with men. Right. Um, Not not as much as she's gained ground with women, but it's still something, you know, there was uh, a number of um, cross tabs, if you, I don't know if that's the right word for sure. it, but yeah, little bits of information in there that could be seen as encouraging, especially taken in context of the movement of the polls, especially over these last six, seven weeks. Um, but the the one bit that I was surprised to see was that since the DNC, she lost ground with men. W- what do you make of, of some of what you're seeing in the polling? Um, I mean, I, I would say this is like, I'm, I'm 48 Right. Um, I would. And a friend of mine that I do a lot of work, he and I were talking, I'm 48. I think he's like 56. So we sort of book in Generation X Um, like white guys in Gen X are like the most intransigent, difficult people to deal with politically. I have no Um, idea what you're talking about. Right. I completely disagree. (laughs) Um, But but no. But look, I I have a name for them. I call them F.U. white guys. These are guys who are often um, educated. Right. They, they are pretty upper income. They live in the suburbs. Their kids either go to private school or go to good schools or and are on a college track. And yet and they, they have jobs. Right. There's a good chance their wives stay at home because they don't have to work, um, but they're still pissed off about everything. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's that sort of middle age on we I, I, I really you know, if we get through November 6th, I want to spend some time with these guys because they don't like the quote unquote system. Right. Which is ironic because the system works so well for them. 
mm. if that makes it. In fact, it's almost designed for them. Um, and it has been for many, many years. And so um, I, I would venture to say that, you know, there's a knee jerk reaction to the vice president being a woman um, and a woman of color, even. I don't, I, I would hate to say that. Uh, I think that if, if they want to get some of that back, I would deploy Governor Waltz to, you know, ex urban and rural areas and, you know, put on the coach's hat and talk about football. Right. I, I think that's, you know, a big reason why he's there and not someone like a Josh Shapiro is because Waltz is looks like a regular guy. He talks like a regular guy, he acts like a regular guy. He, somebody said, you know, what do you think about this? And he, and he started talking about gutters. Right. Like if you own a home, you know, whether it's your gutters or anything else, right, there's always something wrong with it. Right. <laughs> and yeah. you got to fix it. And if you yeah. don't fix it, it gets worse. And then ultimately somebody else has got to fix it because you didn't you, you let it get out of hand. And like, so I think that's one thing that he is relatable on uh, that maybe, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, professional politicians wouldn't be. Uh, but, yeah, I think those those middle aged older men, they are a tough nut to crack. Uh, it's not a new thing. They came along for Biden in somewhat in some fashion in 2020. Uh, they did again for some Democrats in 2022. And so now I think it's just a matter of and this is the, a lot of the work I'll be doing, you know, as part of the union is convincing those guys, look, you may not like Kamala Harris. OK, you might not like Democrats. OK, but this guy, Donald Trump, you owe him nothing. He's yeah. done nothing for you. And the things, the values you really care about, he doesn't represent. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I, you just pissed me off because you just reminded me I got a valve broken on my sprinkler. My brass is turned to brown. So that's yeah. But it speaks exactly. To I your spent point. all so summer getting my life, my my lawn back to life all <laughs> freaking summer. So so, you you know, you make a really good point. And it's it speaks to exactly my trajectory when it came <laughs> to specifically to Tim Walls. I was I when I woke up the morning that Tim Walls was announced, honestly, I got pissed because as a writer center guy, I was really rooting for Josh Shapiro. Also, somebody who pays a little bit of attention to this stuff. I know how critical Pennsylvania is and a, and a governor who's polling 60 plus percent uh, approval in his own home state of that critical home state. Plus, I'm a I'm a he's a launchman. I'm Jewish. So, you know, I was really rooting for 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 that guy. But I'll tell you what. It was like the opposite of the Palin effect for me when uh, Walls was announced. When Palin was announced, I heard a governor uh, who works across the aisle, who will buck her own party, was a mayor before that, a maverick. Oh, I'm interested. And then she opened her mouth and I started losing interest immediately. Right. Walls, on the other hand, I was really pissed off that he got pissed. But then he opened his mouth and I said, oh, now I'm interested. And one of the most uh, there was a lot of really touching moments that I caught during the DNC. Uh, a lot of folks talk about like, look, if you're if you're a dad and you have kids of a certain age mm -hmm. and they're willing to to stand up with tears in their eyes and, and proclaim their and 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 display their love, the genuine, authentic mm -hmm. love for their dad. Like somebody said, you, you've just won at life. Right. So that definitely got me. Uh, but one of the moments that isn't uh, talked about as much is when his team from 99, his football team from 99. Yeah. A couple dozen of those guys came up on stage, and I'm thinking, if any of us, by the time we get to our late 40s, early 50s, you know, uh, he's almost 60, and, yeah. and and we have people from 25 years ago willing to come up and account for the impact that we had on their lives, yeah, yeah. you've won at life. So things like that speak to me. Um, and and when I've had conversations with folks, uh, whether it's guys that are my age, maybe uh, 10, 15 years younger than me or my son, who's, you know, 30 years younger than me. Right. Those are the kinds of things that I think um, break some ground. I did, though, um, feel free to respond to that. But I, I did want to ask you some specific things about the campaign. You mentioned sure. uh, campaign stops and and where they're they're barnstorming. Um, I was curious that it, it, to me, it's peculiar in a way that a couple of the campaign stops that that uh, Trump has made is in states like Montana, which is far afield from where he really needs to be, I would think. But two, like North Carolina, um, what do you think? What, what, does that tell you anything about where his campaign thinks the state of the race is? If he's in some place like North Carolina, that shouldn't have been one of the seven, uh, one sure. of the swing states. Uh, well, the Montana thing had everything to do with the U.S. Senate race there. Um, okay. With John Tester. Tester, and, yeah. Um, what's his name? Sheehy. Okay. Um, uh, Shady Sheehy, I think they call him in every ad I saw for seven days when I was up there this summer. Um, yeah, that had everything to do with they had they had promised somebody at either McConnell or somebody at the Republican Senatorial Committee that he'd make a stop up there. 
Um, so that's what that was. North Carolina is a good question. Um, you know, that North Carolina, I mean, obviously Obama won it. Um, but that's one of those where I'll, I'll tell you, Corey, it's sort of I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. Um, I'd love to believe that it's real. Um, I do think that the Democrats will hold the governor's mansion there just because the Republican running for the governorship there is such a nut. Yeah. Um, you know, that that I think that that's possible. Um, but clear, look, you know, as someone who, you know, I was the director of scheduling in advance for George W. Bush in 2004. So, you know, um, the Carl Robes of the world and the Ken Melmans of the world, the Terry Nelsons of the world, which, you know, they, they're pouring over survey data all the time and saying, OK, where where are we strong? Where are we weak? And so, you know, the, the president's schedule was dictated by, like, where do we think we need to bolster support? Um, and that's not that much different for Trump, which is they're seeing some weakness in North Carolina that that wasn't there when Biden was there. I mean, look, if you saw this, this wasn't a campaign stop, but for Trump, it's the equivalent. Um, was it a week or 10 days ago? Trump went on Twitter, not on Truth Social, but on Twitter to say great things about Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, who right. just weeks earlier, he'd said terrible things about not only Kemp, but also Kemp's His wife, wife in a rally. Yeah. Right. And that said to me that they had seen a significant drop. Uh, in Trump's numbers or a significant surge, probably in African-American support for Harris. Um, and so like Trump doesn't Trump doesn't kiss other people's rear ends. That's what he demands, except that he's completely transactional. So if he thinks he needs to do it, what does he care? Right. Like he'll be like, fine, if I win, you know, I'll ignore the guy anyway. He's never going to he's never going to like Brian Kemp. Right. Let's be clear of that. He he in his own twisted mind believes that Brian Kemp didn't steal Georgia for him in 20 and he'll never forgive him for it. Um, so I, I think you do see that candidates go where they think they need to go. Um, you know, for me, if if you know, I, I'm not privy to all the research they have, but if I'm the Harris and Waltz campaign, you know, it's great to go to Savannah, Georgia, if nobody's been there in a million years. Um, but you know, the two things that are are finite in a campaign are the are the time and and money, and the candidates' time or and money are directly tied to one another, and. Um, you know, if you've got to spend time somewhere, let, make sure it's in a place where you really need to win. Remember, Harris and Waltz can win without North Carolina. They can win without Georgia. They can win without Nevada. They could even win without Arizona if they needed to. But the point is, like, let's go win some of those places. But if you know, for example, that Pennsylvania is do or die, right, then make sure that you're spending all the time you can there. Um, and if you need to get someplace else, that's great. But like, don't spend a lot of time far afield, um, you know, just because you think um, it's a head fake towards the other guys. They're going to know what the ground looks like there. They're, you're not fooling anybody by sending the vice president or, or Governor Waltz someplace that you don't think you can really win. Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, I don't know how closely you follow some of Madrid's numbers, but he he was talking about North Carolina. There are a couple of developments that indicate that it is gettable if the messaging continues on the uh, if uh, the Harris campaign's messaging continues on the path that it seems to have been going. Um, one is um, Raleigh, Durham, and Charlotte are two of the fastest growing uh, areas in the country, right. uh, which means that college educated suburban women are. Um, in, in part of the increase in those populations. Another part of the increase in the population is voting age Latinos. Uh, Latino voters are are part of the you know uh, part of the growth of North Carolina. And if part of your campaign is uh, uh, policy that incentivizes building houses, um, if part of your campaign uh, is is switching gears in terms of what uh, democratic messaging has historically been when it comes to immigration um, to 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 Madrid's ears, that sounds like they're headed in the right direction. So if you're you know if under Biden you were a couple of points behind and you're moving in the right direction in North Carolina. Uh, for for Madrid, that seems like it's um, it's a it's a winnable state. If at the very least, it puts um, it puts Trump's campaign on defense, where they have to spend time there instead of a Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, and look, I mean, uh, in North Carolina too. I mean, you know, the the eastern part of the state is called the Black Belt, um, and I think that you know, if if the Harris campaign wanted to make some real inroads with voters they need, they they would go out there. They would spend some more time and some more resources out there. Um, because there's a lot of black men mm -hmm. out there, right, who are registered to vote. I know the a friend of mine uh, runs the Black Men's Voter Project, and you know those mid propensity black men are gettable for Harris, but nobody talks to them because it's like, oh well, they're not going to vote anyway. Well, they are. They are high information, and they're willing to vote, but nobody ever asks them. Yeah. Right. Um. And so you know you've got to go ask people for their votes, and so. 
you know, look, I, I think you're right. Um, but it's also understanding, okay, who are the people we can get? How do we get them? Um, and, you know, again, this is a, this should be a campaign, not about issues, which is again, what Democrats tend to lean on, but values, right. And how do you speak to a, a, a completely, you know, normal, right. Let's be clear. This is these Harris is normal. Waltz is normal. Trump and Vance are not normal. They are abnormal. <laughs> oh, right? but RFK Jr., that that added to the normality and, factor, yeah, right? And, and Tulsi Gap. Yeah, I mean, again, this is like, it's a freak show, right? And, and this, Corey, I'll just be honest with you. Like, again, after all these years, the idea that this is who's running for one of the major party nominations with all of the things they say and do, say the things they say they want to do, the things they've done, and here we are. We're still neck and neck. It just it sometimes it's just, you know, it's exhausting. Yeah. Um, but it, it is winnable. Um, but, you know, Democrats, this is the other part about the difference between Republicans and Democrats. Right. Is is we came up as young operatives. Right. It's just win, baby. Right. You do what you got to do to win, because the truth is, and this sounds cold hearted, but it is most voters aren't going to remember the campaign the day after it ends. Mm. Um, they're not going to remember the ugliest of the ads. Um, you know, the only time you'll see the ugliest of the ads is like when it comes up in some history or some somebody writes a book about it. Yeah. Um, but the average American voter is not going to remember the Daisy ad from 1964. The right. average American voter is not going to remember Willie Horton from 1988. The average American voter doesn't remember the Swift Boat ads against John Kerry in 2004 until and unless they show up on CNN or something. Um, and so Democrats have to show that they want to win and they have to play hardball. So this is going to be hard for you to do, but I'll ask you to just play along. Sure. If the Republican uh, campaign uh, for president came to you and said, uh, we'll give you anything you want, um, and you have carte blanche on on uh, crafting this campaign and, and redirecting the entire strategy of the campaign, what uh, what advice would you give to that campaign? What are some of the first things that you would do? Uh, I would put them all on a boat and send them out to sea and i'll say <laughs> you guys just stay out there and i'll let you know when it's time to come back sometime in march of next year that's awesome that's one of my favorite lines that anybody's ever given me on this show that is fantastic reminds me of uh did you ever see the movie once around with uh danny aiello and uh mm -hmm. holly hunter he he at one point he's a father and uh he gets so frustrated he says he, he, what, what are you going to do, Dad? What are you going to do? He says, I'm going to build the boat. I'm going to set it out to sea and I'm going to die on it. So yeah. you just uh, cast the re entire Republican campaign out to sea. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, um, you, one of the other things I was curious about is you started the union, was it 2022? Yeah, March of 22. Yeah. How were you able to gain the momentum in just a couple of years to where it was ready to stand on its own as an independent entity? Well, I mean, again, I think that's the 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 pedestal of the Lincoln Project is a pretty good place to start from. Yeah. Um, you know, either two years ago or either even now as a launch point. So, I mean, I I think that you know the work that we had done between December of 2019 and March of 2022 was really responsible for the ability of us to be able to move, uh, you know, that much that many people that quickly. Um, you know, if we didn't have that kind of platform, it would have been very very difficult. But the other part too is I think that. You know what what Lincoln showed us, um, and I think other groups have have shown us to us to a lesser extent is that the you know we started we started this and we operate on this at, you know out of a sense of belief right we're not we're not you know the the union is not a policy organization right we're not taking stands on particular issues here or there we're saying like here are the stakes right and we want you to join us and you know whether you're a Republican a Democrat or an Independent right we don't. We don't, you, there's no, there's no barrier to entry. There's no litmus test to come join us. You, you know, as I like to say, you don't have to agree on everything. You just have to agree on one thing, right? And if we can agree on that one thing for now, right, then we'll get to the place where we can have, as you and I think have talked about with so many of your guests, you know, vigorous, but respectful disagreements on yeah. things that really do matter to the country. But I think the other part too, about why this is so crucial, and I think we don't talk about this enough, although you mentioned you had Ann Applebaum on and, and she wrote not in this most recent book, but in the one before is we have to get back to a place where even if it's a vigorous and sometimes disagreeable conversation, it's a conversation on the same terms. It's the same agenda. It's the same list of things that we think as a nation we need to confront. Right now we have a, a situation where you have one party who's completely in a, in a bubble of its own making and no desire whatsoever to come out of it. 
uh, and the rest of the country going, what is happening with those people? But enough of them, enough of that stuff, you know, leaks out by osmosis to affect enough voters that we're neck and neck 60 days out. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I find so encouraging about the conversation that uh, Joe Walsh and Fred Guttenberg are having around the country at Two Dads Defending Democracy. There are mm-hmm. completely different sides of the gun debate, but they they realize over the course of several conversations that a lot of their values are the same, but the policies by which they arrive at their goals are different. So they're able to have those hard conversations because they agree, they they can agree on reality. They can agree on basic facts. They can also acknowledge each other's values and and recognize their values. One and they look, they're two of my favorites, right? Yeah. And um, I've, you know, spoken with each of them extensively. And I'll just, t- is it, if if I may it, it just indulge me for a second, the idea that a guy like Fred can get up every day and do the work he does with the unbelievable, crushing, searing pain uh, that must carry, that he'll carry with him for the rest of my, his life is, I mean, the guy's to me a freaking hero. Yeah. Right? I mean, I just don't know. How, I, I mean, I have two girls, 12 and 14. If I lost one of them, I don't I, I don't know how I'd be able to get out of bed in the morning. And Fred picks himself up every day and is a leader for his cause. And I just adore the man. Absolutely. A hundred percent. We were lucky to have them both on together here a few months ago. And uh, just prepping for our conversation, it occurred to me that my uh, I'm going to get choked up talking about it again. My middle kid was born one day to the day, same year after um, after his daughter was. Um, so it just, uh, you know, to your point, even if that, that you don't make that, uh, direct as direct of a connection, um, it, it's, it's hard to imagine so that that's why I applaud him so much for getting up and not just, uh, getting through the day, but like fighting on behalf of all of us and on behalf of a even bigger thing on behalf of democracy itself. Yeah. So, uh, some, somebody else that, um, we talked about last time you came on, uh, that, that really made great contributions to our democracy, uh, is your dad. Um, and I was hoping that we could uh, just remember your dad a little bit here. Um, first of all, how you doing? Uh, and um, tell us a little bit about Rich Galen. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, my dad passed away just about a month ago. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not. Let me put it this way: I'm doing well until I'm not. If yeah. that makes sense. Um, and everyone I've talked to have been who's been through something similar has has said something. It's just it's going to hit you. And when it hits you, you know, you've just got to, you've got to let it happen. Um, that, you know, not allowing the grief and the loss and the sadness to wash over you, um, you know, trying to control it as somebody told me, like it will manifest itself somewhere else. If you don't, if you don't just meet it head on. And so, you know, it's, it's been hard and, you know, it's been hard on my mom. I'm an only child. Right. So it's, uh, it's uh, it's been tough, but and I certainly appreciate it. But yeah, look, my dad, my dad started working in Republican politics, I think, in 1979. Wow. Um, and, you know, he worked on Capitol Hill for many years, uh, you know, for a relatively unknown member of Congress from Indiana named Dan Quayle when he was a <laughs> member of the, the U.S. House. And then, you know, when he was the I think at the time, the youngest member of the United States Senate who'd ever been elected. Um, and so, you know, and he worked for Newt Gingrich, uh, when he was in the, you know, minority whip, he spent some time working for then vice president George HW Bush, then Newt again, when he was speaker, uh, and then, you know, after he sort of shook off the, the, the government stuff, uh, you know, he was sort of a blogger before there were bloggers. Um, you know, he was a, he was a talking head before there were talking heads. Um, and you know, he was, uh, he, you know, I, I'll just tell you that the hundreds, if not thousands of messages, uh, I got after his passing from people that he'd worked with here in the U.S. overseas um, was really heartening to to me and my mother. And um, you know, he, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm looking at a picture. He and my my dad and I got to fly on Air Force One together back. Oh in man, right? Um, and that was like that's about as cool as you get, right? Um, um, and so I remember once we were driving along, and you know, he said, and I think I was maybe a senior in college. And I was I was working for Bush at the time, but I, I think I was still an intern. He said, you know, look, if you want to make politics your 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 career, that's fine with me. Right. And if you do well, I'll be happy for you. And if it doesn't work out for you and you you want to do something else, like I'll be happy for you there, too. Um, you know, there was there was an expectation that like because he did help me get in the door. I'm an absolute political Nepo baby. Right. But he <laughs> said, like, I'm going to help you get in the door. But once you get there, it's on you. If you screw it up, I'm not coming to bail you out. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to be one of these guys who, you know, calls in, you know, a whole bunch of favors, um, you know, to to get your rear end out of trouble because you can't get along with people. 
Um, but you know, his effect on, um, you know, the party, um, you know, he was, he was sad, uh, towards the end of his life. He was really sad. Um, you know, I, I think he saw a lot of what he had done is, is wasted. And I, and I tried to, I tried to, you know, tell him that that's not the case, that what we were all seeing, none of us, like we all, we, uh, for all of the smart guys, we all got it wrong. We all missed it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we were all blind to it. You know, I don't know if ignorance is bliss or ignorance, ignorance is blindness, but it was, we all thought we were different than we were. Um, we all thought we were fighting for something noble. Um, you know, we weren't anti people. We weren't, you know, I mean, immigration was a key plank of the party when my dad was a Republican in the eighties and early nineties. Right. I mean, you know, we're talking to somebody earlier today about that, you know, that famous clip of Reagan and Bush in 1980 arguing about who was more pro immigration. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, Reagan amnesties, massive numbers of people in 1986 speaks about it again in his farewell address the night before he leaves office. And so, um, you know, I think for him, it was, you know, as George H.W. Bush would have called it, it was a kinder, gentler party. But he was also there at the turn. Right. When when Gingrich turned it into bare knuckle brawling, um, not for the sake of any one policy, um, but for the sake of saying this is what I want to do to win. And I think, you know, he did regret, you know, Newt working for Newt in the way that that became. Um, but, you know, also you think about it in the 90s, you know, Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton, they passed a hell of a lot of stuff together. They did. Um, you know, and and I don't, you know, looking back, I don't know if that's good or bad. But the point was, like, the White House and the and the People's House worked together yeah. um, on a lot of different things. And, um, you know, my dad was there for a lot of that. And then, you know, he was a fixture in Washington, DC. Um, he mentored a lot of people. He was friends to a lot of people. Um, you know, he knew more reporters, you know, than, than I could shake a stick at. And, you know, he'd gone, he was in Eastern Europe, uh, in Romania and Hungary, right after the Berlin wall fell, wow. uh, you know, for the international Republican Institute. So, you know, he'd been all over creation. I don't think he was ever happier than when he was getting on an airplane to go someplace far away. I don't yeah. know what that says about me and my mom, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I'm going to ask you, we have this, our, what we call the TPNR question. And I, sure. I, uh, I, I hinted at it before, but I'm going to ask it in a slightly different way. What do you think Rich Galen would say uh, that each of us can do to be able to share space with, have better conversations with, and perhaps even nurture relationships with people across our differences. So that's people who have different backgrounds and beliefs than we do, right. who get their news from different sources than we do. How can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other? Or is it even possible? Uh, it's always possible. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it's harder. I think right now it's harder. Yeah. Um, um, and we're, you know, and I, I'm probably Corey, a, a factor in this, right. in in the stuff I do, like, uh, you know, when I when I want to come out swinging, like I don't, you know, I come out swinging, um, and and I do believe that there are times when if you see an authoritarian movement or bad people who have done bad things and want to tell you they want to do bad things, I have to, I think you have to speak plainly about that, um, and you know, like I, I I have lost many friends to Trumpism, um, and you know, I hope that when he's gone, that they they come back to reality and they you know they they try and you know, write themselves with the world. Um, but I, I think that, you know, without, without victory um, in this election, it's much tougher with someone like that, who is so willing to be so destructive and so many people willing to follow him down that path. I think it's a really difficult thing right now. Um, yeah. Again, look, I'm not going to get in a screaming match with somebody. I mean, I, you know, we went out to dinner last week with a couple of friends of ours who are very, very conservative, um, you know, and, they, you know, the, I, I, my wife said, don't bring up politics. I said, I never would. I, and I never do right in social situations. If somebody wants to talk to me about it, yeah. happy to do it. I'm never going to bring it up. Um, and they wanted to talk about it and, you know, I kept my cool and they, you know, throwing stuff at me. I'm like, okay, great. Oh yeah. You believe that? Okay. Well, I can't, I, you know, it's not true, but yeah, you're going to believe what you want to believe. And again, as we talked about near the top, you know, that's, that's all I can do. I'm, you know, I'm likely to be friends with these people, you know, over the course of the next 60 days and beyond. And, you know, I'm not going to throw a, a plate of pasta at them because they disagree with me or because they believe mis and disinformation. Uh, I just have to hope that, you know, when this fever breaks, uh, that they feel better and that, you know, that to your point about the differences, it's differences in method or methodology and not ideology so much. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. 
Good stuff. Yeah. Just um, at prioritizing the relationship over, you know, winning some sort of imaginary debate. Uh, I, I think at least it keeps you in the game. It keeps you in the conversation. Um, do you have any questions for me? Well, I would just love to know how you get through the day and what it is you see. Um, you know, here you are trying to find ways for folks to be civil to one another, to have, to have those better conversations. So is there anything that you've seen that is something, uh, there's no such thing as a silver bullet, but have you, do you have any tips for, for me on how to do this better? Because I, I know I'm a, I'm a learning creature to the extent that that's possible. Well, you, you touched on, as I've been thinking through this conversation, you, you touched on some realities <laughs> that I think if we're okay with, it, it, it helps us sleep better at night. It helps us keep a sense of peace. And that is, you know, in advance that you're going to have to knock on so many doors before you get to have a conversation. You, mm -hmm. you also probably know at this point that you're going to have to um, get to a certain number of conversations before you have one that gets to the point where you feel like, oh, that was productive. I feel like we got somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think knowing in advance that um, I am not... It, it, I'm not going to get into a conversation with somebody in any forum, whether it's on social media or in, in the coffee shop or my Bible study, where it's going to end in a way that if I imagine the best possible scenario, that it's going to end that way. I'm mm. okay with that. Um, sometimes, sometimes we're going to have what Monica Guzman calls the, I never thought of it that way moment. And that's mm. great. But yeah. in order to establish that, I have to have that mindset myself. I have For to. Sure allow for the possibility that this person is going to say something where, huh, I never thought of it that way. And I um, love those moments, to be honest with you. Yeah. I love those moments because I find, I find, you know, my own small mindedness frustrating sometimes. Um, and, you know, when you've done this as long as I have, you know, I'm very guilty of it, but I love those moments because I'm like, wait, here's someone that has a, you know, has, has thought enough about it to bring something to the, to the conversation I didn't expect or think about. And like, now they're like, Oh, okay, sure. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Something else I've learned the hard way over these last, uh, it's almost 11 months now, um, is that I also have to know the conversations that are toxic for me. Yeah. That it, it, and it's not necessarily a reflection of the other person, but there are certain issues. I have family in Israel. Uh, so there have been conversations that I've entered into that I realized, yeah, this is not going to go well. It's not going to, it's certainly not going to end well um, right. for, for any number of reasons. So I have to recognize certain signs that this is not a place where I'm going to be able to be a healthy contributor um, uh, or, or that the person is bringing stuff to the table that in some way is going to, I don't know, resonate a certain way that, that just isn't, isn't healthy for either of us. So I have to know the conversations to avoid. And it's kind of like the martial arts version of like the best fight you get into is a fight that you don't get into in the first sure. place. Right. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's part of it. Um, but so before we go, how can we follow you, find more information about the home front and the union sure. and all the great work that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, please go to join the union.us again, that's join the union.us. We need every set of hands and feet we can get. Um, to get out there and, you know, make calls and send texts and write postcards and knock on doors. Uh, and again, the, the home front, both on Substack and on Apple podcasts, uh, anywhere you get podcasts, but Apple's usually where people find them. And then on social media, you can find me on Twitter and TikTok at Reed Galen and on Instagram and threads at Reed underscore Galen USA. Cool. We will definitely put some of those links in the show notes. Reed, it was great to hang out with you again, man. I, I hope at some point we get to do this in person. I'd really love to buy a, you know, buy a, well, you don't, I, I think you're, you're not a drinker. So I'll buy yeah. you a milkshake or something like that. Right, listen, I will always take a milkshake. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. No, listen, I, yeah, I'd love to come out to the, to the golden state and see you. And yeah, we could do this in person. That'd be great. That'd be great. Thanks again for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, and as always, if you dig what we're doing here, remember to follow the show and write the review. Uh, and now you can join the conversation on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash politics and religion. Check it out. Subscribe. Get some swag. Really excited about all that. Now, go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. <laughs>